everyone. I'm Trevor Ash, the Executive Vice President of CIE Manufacturing and a member of IANA's Board of Directors. On behalf of all my hardworking colleagues in both our Virginia and California manufacturing facilities, I'd like to welcome you to this IANA webcast, Understanding Drage, part of IANA's The Business of Intermodal Continues program. We have a great session lined up for you today on a topic near and dear to everyone's heart, Drage. Let's be straight, there is no intermodal if you take away Drayman making the first mile, the last mile, and the crosstown moves. Today, Hal Pollard, IANA's Director of Education, will be joined by Val Noel, Executive Vice President and Chief Operations Officer of Track Intermodal. Val will share his thoughts and insights on Drage. Val has a diverse background that covers nearly every corner of intermodal, from rail to trucking to chassis provider. This is gonna be a great session. Now I'll turn it over to Hal to get us all started. Thank you. Well, thank you, Trevor. That was great. I'm really pleased to be here with this session, Understanding Drayage with Val Noel from Track Intermodal. As Trevor mentioned, Val's got quite a, a history in Intermodal. He's worked in uh, nearly every corner of it. He's got a lot of great perspective that will be able to share with us today. First of all, I'd like to thank our silver and our bronze year-long sponsors for making this session possible, bringing that to you, as well as other educational programming that we do throughout the year. They go the extra mile for us, so we appreciate it. So with that, I am going to go ahead and dive right in uh, and, and focus on the topic that, as, as Trevor said in his intro, this is a session that hits everybody. Intermodal is really nothing without the Drayman, as, as I like to say, boxes don't move themselves, right? It, it takes an intermodal network to do it, and the Drayman are, are a key part of it. So to get us started, Val, you've got, you've got such an interesting career. Could you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your background, you know, how you got started in intermodal and kind of what you're up to now? Al, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I uh, appreciate it. So I got started in the uh, intermodal space back in 1983 when I got out of college. Going to college, my parents always said to me and my brothers and sisters, whatever you do, don't get in the transportation business. So I started in the insurance business out of school for about six months, realized that was never going to work, and took an opportunity with a company called Chessie Motor Express, which at the time was the pickup and delivery oh. carrier for the Chessie System Railroad. Eventually, Chessy System merged with uh, Seaboard and formed what people now know as CSX. And I spent the first uh, 11 years of my career working on the, the pickup and delivery side at Chessy Motor Express. At that time, we were a, a centralized base company in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. And in 1987, when CSX Corporation decided to form what was then called CSX Sealand Intermodal, the leader of that company, Neil Porter, uh, who had a trucking background, said that the only way that we were going to be successful is that we needed to open up truck terminals across the country to be able to perform pickup and delivery oh. services, which was called then, now first and last mile today. And I got the opportunity to go to Atlanta, Georgia in 1987 to what was then called the Holsey Intermodal Facility, a brand new facility on the old family line seaboard network and opened up Chessie Motor Express and started down there with no trucks, no business, no customers. And 18 months later, left that operation with a little bit over 40 power units and a fair amount of pickup and delivery business, uh, primarily from intermodal marketing companies. From there, uh, we expanded, uh, started a role running the East region for Chessie Motor Express up until 1994 when I moved to Jacksonville, Florida. And in Jacksonville, I got an opportunity for three years to be in charge of the equipment for CSX Intermodal. Equipment at that time encased everything from rolling stock rail cars, as well as trailers, containers, and chassis. And that's where I really can say I got my first exposure to maintenance and repair and how detailed you needed to be to be able to make sure you kept your rolling stock up to speed and you kept your rolling stock safe. So I did that till uh, 1997. And at that point, I uh, was transferred back again to Atlanta, spent a couple of years building uh, the Fairburn facility that CSX has today in, south of Atlanta, and, and went through that process, which was rather interesting. And then from there, CSX acquired their share of Conrail, and I moved up to Kearney, New Jersey, and took over the role of terminal operations for all the former Conrail properties, as well as the former CSX properties in the North region. 
And that's where I really got a great exposure to what it takes to run a terminal and what you have to plan for as far as chassis, matching the right box to the right chassis, being able to make sure you provide a high quality of piece of equipment to the trucker. And that's where I really began to embrace more of the driver experience. I'll never forget being in Kearney, New Jersey, a gentleman by the name of Sam Frugia would call me. And he always would complain to me and said, Val, you know, I'm sick and tired of my drivers coming to Kearney and they have to go be your free valet service to pick up a box. They have to take it over to road ability, they have to get it fixed, and then they have to go in line to get out of the facility. Nobody's paying them for that. And I credit Sam with really badgering me, I think it's, it's a fair word, that we had to do better. And in my opinion, when I hear people talk about the driver experience, I lived that for uh, almost four years of my life. And for anybody that was around North Jersey after the Conroe acquisition was split between Norfolk Southern and CSX, there were some trying times um, and it was a challenge, but I really got a better taste. And, and, and again, I came from the Drage background, but I got a real appreciation for what a driver goes through when he gets run around a terminal and he gets forced to do everything for free. So then how from there, I got transferred back to Jacksonville and uh, I had an opportunity to partake in a program uh, that was called uh, Critical Capacity, where we tried to operate like a trucking company. A tr for a trucking company to be successful, they have to drive out their empty miles. And at that time, we had a large imbalance. Uh, we had a ton of freight coming uh, eastbound, and we had little to no freight going westbound. And a gentleman by the name of Pete Rutsky had an idea that we would be able to go to third-party brokers, and we would be able to effectively compete with an over-the-road van, and we would be able to move over the road cargo in an intermodal box and pick up westbound traffic to balance our network. And that program went from about maybe 10, 20 loads a week uh, to we actually celebrated uh, 1,000 loads a week in our 18th month of operation. Uh, so it was a great experience, again, all about the truck, all about how we made the truck more profitable by running more loaded miles. And it, 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 was, it was a great opportunity. And then from there, my last role was was the leader of, of the intermodal group at, uh, at CSX. Fast forward, I then went to Pacer, spent uh, nine years at Pacer, all running uh, the Pacer Cartage operation, a little bit over 1,600 independent owner operators. We ran four different flags at that time. Uh, we ran a flag called Pacer Cartage, which was the majority of our fleet. We had a fleet called Harbor Rail Transport, which ran to and from the port of LA Long Beach. We had a fleet called uh, Rail to Rail Transportation, uh, which was a, um, a boutique operation that we ran in Chicago for specific customers. Uh, and then we had a, a fleet that was associated with the warehouse division called PDS Trucking. So I did that for nine years. And then I joined Track. Actually, November will be seven years. And I've had a pretty good uh, exposure, I, I would say, to a lot of different facets within the intermodal uh, life cycle, uh, both from the truck side, the rail side, the terminal side, the equipment side, MNR side, uh, and obviously the drape side. It's a great story because I think, you know, you, you touch on so much of the business and so many pieces of the business. You've worked with so many folks that are, uh, you know, real standouts in the industry. So it, it's great to, you know, to hear you kind of lay it out. Uh, first, I wanted to start with the fundamentals, really go to the basics and kind of work up from there. So from your perspective, what is drayage and how does it work? From my perspective, a drayman is the unsung hero in the intermodal industry, in my opinion. A drayman is responsible and accountable to pull a lot of pieces together to be able to make that first mile or last mile successful. And, you know, it, it, again, my view of things, a drayman gets a lot of balls dumped their way and they have to juggle those balls, whether that's uh, making sure they know when the last free day is, when they where they're sourcing a chassis from, scheduling the delivery, making sure that you know you can get in and out of the facility in a timely fashion and get to your appointment on time. A lot of things that people take for granted, but are challenges each and every day. I think that's what the Drage uh, community does well, and one of the reasons why I, I really Drage became part of my blood is I love the fact that each and every day was something different. And you dealt with a different set of dynamics, a different set of challenges each and every day, whether that's an owner operator falling off a load, whether that's a drop and pick turning into a stay with or a stay with turning into a floor load or whatever the scenario may be. 
You always had to be on your toes. You always had to be nimble. And I think that's one of the things that Draymond don't get a, credit, a lot of credit for, and that is their ability to be able to react. And yes, the Drage community does a lot of proactive planning, but they also do a lot of reaction to situations that are dealt to them outside their control. And they don't get enough credit for that, in my opinion. That makes loads of sense. Um, and, and you mentioned a, a few different types of loads. Could you talk a little bit more about what the different types of loads are that a Draymond might experience on any given day? Yeah, so when I was at Pacer, we always called it uh, shipment profile. And what did that profile look like? So what was the commodity? Was it a live pickup? Was it a live delivery? Was it a drop and pick? Um, it was a drop and pick. How long were they going to hold on to the box? And really, when we look at how we wanted to source our freight, we tried to figure out how we could get the most loads per power unit per day. Given the fact that it's no secret to anyone on this call, uh, driver availability is a challenge. And what we always tried to do is build a model that would allow us to be able to get the most loads per power unit per day. So we would have a tendency to try to shy away from maybe a floor load or a stay with pickup or a stay with delivery or maybe a drop and pick where they were going to hold onto the trail unit for two weeks to unload. We would always weigh out those different dynamics and then make a decision as to which freight we wanted to select and how that freight would fit in with our network uh, and how well it complemented the network. So shipment profile was something that was always near and dear to our heart. And I was always interested interested in it because I wanted to make sure the owner operators, because we were an owner operator based company, that our owner operators had an opportunity to be able to earn enough money to be able to support their truck, pay their taxes, do whatever they needed to do to maintain their vehicle to a safe standard, and then be able to take care of their family. Our group at on the party side really interacted with our pricing group on how we selected that car. For some of the, the folks that are that may be new to the to the industry, could you talk about the differences between a company driver and an independent owner operator? So um, I, I think a fair number of the folks that are on this call understand the difference. A company employee basically is an employee where you're responsible for them and you have accountability for all their tax liabilities. An independent owner operator or a 1099 is a independent contractor that you would offer them an opportunity to perform a pickup and delivery service and they would have, they would have the right to be able to say yes or no to it. You know, there's a lot of tests that, that are out there as to whether or not you're treating an independent owner operator the right way. And I think for the most part, everybody in our industry complies with that. And um, everybody's focused on how can we treat an independent contractor as an independent 1099 a business person and how can we do B2B with them so that they're successful and uh, the enterprise is, is successful. I think some people don't understand how critical of an issue this is because look, if you've been around intermodal for a little bit of time, you know that intermodal has a tendency to ride a roller coaster from a demand perspective. And one of the things that an independent owner operator model allows this industry is to be able to ride that demand curve up and down and utilize the independent owner operator for elasticity when demand spikes significantly like what we're going through right now. And I really do think it's incumbent upon uh, everyone in our industry to get a little bit more up to speed and involved in what's going on in two key states, New Jersey and California, because to what you were just saying, how I know IANA has been involved in this, but this is an important item in my opinion. Um, and to me, we're at a crossroads as an industry as to what's ultimately going to happen. I couldn't agree with you more. I think the the conservative numbers that I've seen are about 80% of all intermodal is handled by independent uh, owner operators. It's probably a little higher, but I think if you you factor in international moves and domestic moves, you know, a huge part of our economy uh, is is moved by uh, entrepreneurs. You know, independent owner operators are fundamentally small business owners and, and, and entrepreneurs, and we as an industry rely on them uh, for, for our business, um, you know, day to day and particularly at times, as you point out, with times like these when when, uh, when things are, are, are tight 
and, um, and we do need to really pay attention. So um, if folks are interested, there's some more information on the IANA website. We've been collaborating with our colleagues in, in, in state associations and local associations um, in both California and New Jersey and continue to look at the issue nationwide because it's a, it's a critical thing that I think you're absolutely right, Val. We need to have every single person in the industry pay attention to and, and get behind. So we talked about the role that the Draymond plays a little bit. Could you talk a little bit about some of the major factors that uh, are affecting the Draymond, kind of the, the inputs and outputs? Well, you know, obviously the, the topic that we just talked about is a major issue for the Drake community and how that ultimately gets resolved. From my standpoint, you know, we as an industry, probably a lot of people on this call go to the uh, spring and fall sessions that IANA has. And we have a tendency at these sessions to talk about the driver experience and how we need to enhance that. And I truly believe that in the 33 years I've been around this industry, that we haven't done enough in that regard. Several years ago, we had this study at IANA through the Ops Committee that I was part of that called having uh, a road-ready piece of equipment. Uh, we have a study now going on, I think it's through the Operations Committee, about how to enhance the driver experience. Um, I really do think it's incumbent upon all of us to, to clearly understand what does the driver experience mean. And in my humble opinion, while things like a phone, a restroom, a, a, a rest area, all that's nice, but really at the end of the day, what the owner operator wants to do is get in and get out. They don't want to be run around the block. And again, I go back to my experience with Sam Ferrugia, where he said, I don't want to be your free valet service. I don't want to put your unit to road ability. I don't want to be your quality control. I want to be able to arrive. I want to be able to pick up a piece of equipment. And I want to be able to get out the gate. And when you think about it, that's the best thing that could happen to all of us because we improve the service of the intermodal product. Our on-time performance hopefully gets better. The independent owner operator gets to handle more loads per power unit per day, which makes them financially more reliable. And the, the, the drage company or the enterprise is able to be more successful because they can drive a higher revenue and hopefully a better margin at the end of the day. So my view is, I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a big item. Third, drive, just driver availability. You know, the recent uh, regulation change to be able to reduce the age, I think is a positive step forward. How autonomous vehicles play out, I think will be interesting as we move forward. I don't know if that will happen in my career or, or not, but how that would or would not impact intermodal drage uh, will be interesting to see. And then I think as a power units go to alternative fuels, how do we as a, a country solve the fuel tax issue? And do we change from a fuel tax to like a VMT or some other type of mechanism to be able to get the revenue base that's needed to keep the infrastructure in our country going? Uh, so I think they're coming at some of the things they may be broader than just intermodal, uh, but I do think that there's some of the key things that the, the intermodal drage slash trucking industry will face in the coming years, in my view. There's a lot there to unpack, but um, what do you think are some of the things that we can, as an industry, work together to improve to help drive up uh, drage productivity? I would say, to me, there's, there's a, a couple things. One is we have to figure out how each stakeholder that operates in its individual silo can start doing a better job of sharing information. So here's an example. You have some cargo that comes in right now from Asia, obviously a lot of cargo coming in from Asia. It would be interesting to know as an equipment provider, how much of that cargo has to deliver tomorrow versus how much of that cargo is gonna deliver on last free day. Just having, those, having that insight, I think would allow all of the stakeholders to be able to get a better view as to what the playing field looks like and allow us to be able to make better decisions than we make today. I think today we make, and we're just, we're, the, the chassis guys just as much to blame as anybody here. So don't, don't think I'm trying to pass the buck. But right. I think all of us make decisions today in a vacuum or in our individual silo. And we don't have a tendency to see what everybody else is dealing with. So as a result, our decision has a catastrophic impact on two or three or four other stakeholders within the intermodal supply chain. So I, I think figuring out how we can do a better job of collaborating on that would actually go a, a, a long way. 
I do think we have to figure out a way to truly enhance the driver experience uh, because I think that's something that's sorely lacking and really needs to be improved upon, in my opinion. And I think we have to stop giving it window dressing about some of the, the things that we talk about and really get down to the granular level about how do we make that truck more productive? Because I do think, uh, I do think that's an important piece for, for everybody, not just for the drage community, but for the entire intermodal, uh, intermodal chain. So I think there are a couple of things, Hal, that are, that are, uh, that are pretty important. Yeah, it, it is a really interesting and pretty unique industry in that it is so collaborative and that for everyone to really optimize, they, to a degree, have to help their business partners uh, optimize as well. To, to switch gears a little bit and kind of maybe take it up a little bit, uh, because you've got you know, such a good sort of perspective on the, uh, the industry, I wanted to, to, to throw out a couple of questions for you that are a little higher level. The first one, from your perspective, what do you see as some of the most pivotal moments uh, in the industry throughout your career? Uh, to me, one of, the, one of the most interesting change was when our industry converted from a trailer dominance to a container dominance. When I alluded that I started uh, with Chessie, my first year I was at an intermodal ramp. It was a circus style ramp. It'd be interesting of the 253 people on this call today, how many of them wouldn't know what a circus style intermodal ramp was. But when we transitioned from the trailer world, TOFC to COFC, and then to double stack, to me, that was one of the biggest fundamental switches in, in, in the intermodal industry. The trailer world was pretty simple uh, and it worked pretty well. Unfortunately, it just didn't give the railroads the economies that they were looking for. And double stack gave them the economies, but unfortunately created some um, challenges uh, for the terminal operator as well as for the drage community. Uh, and I'm still not 100. I think the terminals uh, on the rail side have done a great job in building new facilities with new technology, with new operating um, uh, business processes. I think from a Drayman perspective that we haven't been able to advance uh, on the drage side where we need to. And that's not because of anything the drage community has done wrong. I just think it's because the drage community, unfortunately, gets looked at last. And I still think we owe it to the drage community as to how we can make their experience in a container world as easy and as seamless as it was in a trailer world. And Again, in my opinion, people on this call may disagree with me, but we still have a long way to go as an industry. And I think that was a key turning point, uh, had a profound impact on everybody, definitely had an impact on me because I was transitioning from terminal operations and equipment at that time uh, back into drage. And it definitely made our job a little bit more challenging on the drage side because the fragmentation that is associated with Intermodal got even more fragmented in a container world that was in a trailer world. Just for those that, that don't know, what is a circus ramp? The so circus style ramp is uh, the ramp I worked at was 13 stub end tracks. Uh, longest track was 1,200 feet. Uh, you would back a car in, you would put in what was called a bridge plate. Uh, the plate would lay from car to car, basically creating a bridge. And then you would take a jockey tractor, you would back it up a ramp, and you would begin to unload it. As soon as that entire track was unloaded, you would reload it with outbound cars. And eventually, at the end of the day, you'd, you'd get a switch engine in there. You'd start putting the whole train together, and away it would go. And the name for it was circus style because that's the way they used to unload the circus train. Uh, same exact way. And it stuck. And it was uh, it was an interesting experience. Yeah. I, I bet. So from, uh, from a, a point of, uh, of challenge... What do you see as some of the, the most challenging parts of folks learning the industry? And do you have any tips for folks that are coming in, either transitioning over from another mode of transportation or another part of the industry and coming into intermodal? Yeah, so, so in my opinion, again, the, the folks on this call may have a different perspective. I think just trying to understand the many different pieces and how they all come together to perform a door-to-door -door move. I, I think people on the outside look in and think it's relatively simple, but there are a host of dynamics, both on the domestic product, a 53 footer moving you know, door to door within our country, uh, as well as an import uh, or an export. 
I think the other thing that's kind of unique about our industry is the fact that we love acronyms. And, you know, it's almost like if someone new comes into our industry, you almost have to give them a book of what all the acronyms mean. And, and, and somehow we as an industry need to figure that out. Um, it's just amazing how that works. I try to explain to, you know, friends uh, and start, I start using the acronym thing and they, they're like, what are you talking about? Uh, and I, I just, I, I think as a new person coming in, that, that definitely is a challenge. And, you know, to some extent could scare away people uh, from our industry, which I think would be a huge negative. But just, just, you know, figuring out that acronym piece, figuring out the fragmentation, figuring out how you put all the pieces together, I, I think they're the, they're, they're the big things. And again, on the drainage side, I, I said it earlier, I'll say it again. A lot of those pieces, the drainage is forced to put together in today's world. And I think we as an industry have to figure out how we can do a better job of collaborating and affording the drainage a better opportunity to be able to execute uh, and execute well. That's a really good point. And you know, to the to the acronym um, question, I think you're 100% right. Um, Iana actually, uh, we put together a glossary of terms, uh, and a significant portion of it is 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 acronyms. So if folks actually want a little cheat sheet, if you go over to intermodal.org, go to the resource center, look for glossary, we can help you out. Trust me, everybody. Hal didn't pay me to say that. It's just interesting that he was able <laughs> to pick back up on that. We're, we're starting to get some good questions from the audience, uh, but I've got a, a couple more uh, I just kind of want to weave in. You kind of touched on it, but what do you think are the most critical things that, that our industry needs to address in the next five to 10 years to, 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 to maintain our, our position and to grow the, the intermodal business? So I, I think first and foremost, we have to continue to try to strive to be the safest mode of transportation in, in our country. And I think that's incumbent upon everybody uh, within uh, the intermodal supply chain, uh, whether you're a terminal operator, whether you're a railroad, whether you're a drayman, uh, a BCO or a, a shipper, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to try to uh, make it as safe as we possibly can. I think the second thing is service. Uh, you know, we as an industry have kind of ridden that roller coaster, both on the demand side as well as on the service side. And I think our industry has come a long way in figuring out the service piece, but I do think we still have a ways to go. If we're going to effectively compete uh, and be able to, do, to take uh, cargo and move it uh, from the road to intermodal, I, I think the service is, is important. And the, the reason why I'm bullish about the service piece is because every time we can move a 53-foot unit off the road and put it in the intermodal, it's great for the environment. And whether people want to believe or not believe in, in uh, global warming, I think we all owe it to ourselves, to our kids and to our grandkids to try to do the right thing from an environmental standpoint. And the better we make intermodal and the more carbon footprint we can reduce, I think the, uh, we all will be better for that. I, I think the, the, the last challenge is, again, how do we break down the silo and enhance the collaboration between the various stakeholders within Intermodal. Now, you know, I, I really do think it's at the end of the day, there's a role for IANA there, whether that's some type of data warehouse, whether that's some type of portal that could be used, but somehow we have to figure out how everybody can get better visibility as to what's going on in the Intermodal domestic supply chain, as well as in the Intermodal international supply chain, so that we can enhance uh, the overall product. You touched on a lot of stuff that is uh, near and dear to, I think, everybody's heart. Val, I'm going to pivot over and start hitting you with some questions from our audience because uh, we've got a bunch of great ones here. Um, and I'll, I'll start off and, um, you know, I'll, I'll go back to um, something that you touched on and, and part of your, your career in the past and now very much a part of, of your current role at, at Track Intermodal is – how do you see post trips and DVIRs affecting the improvements of quality and turn times in the industry? And have you seen any improvements in, in this area? Uh, that, that's a, whoever uh, sent that question, that's a great question. From a DVIR standpoint, it's probably one of the biggest frustrations that our industry has dealt with since that uh, law became reality. What something, you know, some, I went to a class once where it said intent versus impact. 
and the intent of that law was, was great. The impact has been almost negligible. And I do think we have to figure out and we have to work the drage community, the terminal operator, the equipment provider with the government and figuring out how we can build a better mousetrap. Um, because th today it's not working. You know, I, I, I don't know the most current stats, 98% of the units that come back to a rail terminal, a, a CY, a third party depot, a marine terminal, all come in with no DVIR. So by the technical letter of the law, that says that's a good order piece of equipment. I think all of us would say that that's probably not reality. We have to figure out a way that we can identify that equipment on the front end. Because I learned many years ago, the principles of quality is do the right thing right the first time. And when you let a bad order piece of equipment into a facility, and then you try to go find a needle in the haystack, it creates a lot of problems and a lot of inefficiencies for everyone. So I, I, think, um, I think the DVIR is unbelievably important. And unfortunately, it's one that in its current configuration is, isn't getting us much traction. And we have to figure out a way as an industry to make that more powerful. Uh, because I think we all win. And, and I know the drage community has some reservation about it because they fear that, hey, if I turn a DVIR in, that, that damage, that chart, that's all gonna wind up back in me. And somehow we have to have, as I said to Mike Burton, the owner of CNK Trucking in Chicago, we have to have an adult conversation about how we deal with that. Um, because if that's the only impediment to turning into the DVIR, then we as an industry ought to be able to figure that one out. But I think it's a great question, and it's definitely something that we, we, need, to, we need to sort out going forward. That's a, a, a really good bit of wisdom for us all to take to heart. It's not going to solve itself, and we all need to work together to figure out a, a path forward. And this one is um, the 53-foot container length with the 40-foot imports is clearly a mismatch and requires transloading. Do you see any any changes in that down the road? Do you have any any thoughts on that? So in my Pacer life, we had uh, a warehousing division and we did a lot of that consolidation work where we would bring in 40 foot cans, strip them, pick and pack, and then send back out a 53 footer. It's something that, again, in my career, you've seen uh, a lot of uh, roller coaster where there was, a, you know, the ocean carriers decided they didn't want their box to go IPI and they would cross dock and go into a domestic either over the road van or a 53 foot air motor container. And then ocean carriers decided, hey, they want to go in interior on an IPI move because it gives them a better opportunity to try to pick up an export load. So I think a lot of that depends upon what the dynamics are in the various trade lanes and what impact the ocean carriers want to have on their equipment, either get it back to you know, the origin point for the next head haul load, or do they want to be able to use it as, as, a, as a backhaul uh, on the export side? I think there will always be a place for transloading. The question will be, does it continue to grow or does it plateau? And, and honestly, I, I, I don't know that now. Here's one sort of going back to a, a, an earlier topic that, that you touched on. Why is the owner-operator model so so popular, and why is there the disparity between owner-operator and company drivers and intermodal from your perspective? The, this is my experience. Uh, again, I'm sure a lot of people on this call may have a different view, but the independent owner-operator model in my career, both at CSX as well as at Pacer, allowed us to be able to flex the workforce, to be able to meet the demands both up and down. Um, and allowed us to be able to be nimble. Uh, it allowed us to be able to build a pickup and delivery model that we could rely on, but not be encumbered with all that fixed cost. Because at the end of the day, we as a drage company don't own the freight like a traditional over the road company who is going out to, and, and sourcing that cargo. We, we get the cargo through either an ocean carrier, a BCO relationship, an IMC, intermodal marketing company relationship, and you just don't know how that demand curve is going to be. And the independent owner operator all, always allowed us that flexibility to be able to ramp up or ramp down, depending upon what that demand curve looked like. Uh, so for us, it was all about how we could be responsive to our customer, uh, allow us to be able to afford our customer the best economics and do it in a fashion that would allow the company to still be able to be profitable at the end of the day. Um, and Look, is there, in my opinion, is there a role for a company truck in intermodal? I definitely think there is. 
I think it, you know, depending upon what type of customer you have, uh, how much density that customer has, what that shipment profile of that customer might look like, where you can spin, you know, a, a company owned truck multiple times in a day, uh, and you do that five days a week, th there's probably a, 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 a niche there for that. Well, I don't think our industry would ever, again, my opinion, move 100% to company truck, nor do I think it would move 100% to independent owner operator unless something happened on the regulatory side. Got it. Got it. Thank you, sir. Here's one um, in, in terms of trucking company fleet size, but do you see that uh, trucking companies have had to uh, size their fleets differently due to things like the current economic situation, uh, dealing with larger ships, challenges at, at terminals, uh, things like that? Look, I still have a pretty good uh, relationship with many truckers across the country, and I've seen some truckers who have scaled their operations back because of their niche in that given market and the fact that they claim that they can be a much better company and a much more profitable company uh, and a much more responsible company by running a right size fleet. And, and bigger is always not better. You've got some other players out there who have decided that they can leverage their technology play and their backroom infrastructure and their ability to be able to procure key things like insurance and they can make some acquisitions and expand their footprint. So I think it all depends upon each company's vision and what they think uh, they wanna be as they continue to mature and evolve as a business. Um, but I've seen it play both ways. And, and to be honest with you, everybody that, that, I, that I know in this industry that's, that's done one or the other has ma managed to be successful. Great. Here's one, you mentioned it a little bit in that, in that last question, but I'm kind of melding a couple of, of different questions together here, but um, the industry's got a lot of new digital players that are that are coming into the marketplace and offering services. In terms of how they'll play out in the industry and things that they need to consider, um, what do you think those new digital players um, need to think about as they kind of move towards being uh, productive and then successful in the industry? I, I, I think as, as, as that digital plays out, breaking down those silos, how that we talked about earlier, breaking down those, those walls uh, and allowing uh, all, the, all the players within an intermodal shipment cradle to grave to have visibility and getting that visibility out there real time so that people can make intelligent decisions. Um, and I, I truly believe there, for someone who can build a mousetrap to do that, uh, I think would be unbelievably powerful for our industry uh, and be unbelievably rewarding as well. I, I still believe that that's one of the, the biggest issues or challenges that we have is how to do that effectively. Yeah, and th this is a this is sort of riffs on that. It's kind of tied in there, but how do those those digital players and those platforms? How do you think those are going to affect the sector's relationship with owner operators? You think it's going to help them or hurt them? Look, again, my opinion is. The more that we collaborate, the better we build a plan today for tomorrow, tomorrow for the next day, next day for next week, I think we all get better. We all become more efficient. We all become more productive. Uh, we improve the throughput. We make the intermodal supply chain that much more fluid. And quite candidly, again, in, in my view, if we get better, that should free up capacity for us to be able to handle more and more freight. And at the end of the day, that's what this is all about, is how can we grow the product? How can we grow it through improvements in service, improvements in safety, improvements in productivity, um, and, and continue to make the intermodal a viable transportation mode in the U.S.? It makes a whole lot of sense. Here's one that's talking about some of the, the changes that have come about a lot fueled by, by the explosion of, of online retail, online commerce. Uh, but how do you feel about the increased demand for expedited shipments? And they, they, they mentioned things like team loads, air freight, hot shots, and PPE requirements and, and things like that. How, how do you see those things um, affecting Intermodal's business model? So I, I can't comment on, on the air freight side. I will tell you on the ocean side, we're seeing more and more of these expedited services starting up from Asia to the U.S. And make no mistake about it, and I'm going to say this because I'm old, but the younger generation, they like to buy, 
there are things off the internet. I personally, I still am old school where I go to the, I go to the mall. But as our kids and their kids grow older and more mature and continue to that habit of buying more and more off the internet, I think the uh, need for express shipments are only going to continue. You know, you look back a couple of years, there was one ocean carrier doing it. Now there's multiple ocean carriers doing it. Whether or not you see that begin to transition into the Atlantic uh, transatlantic trade as well, like it is in the trans-Pacific trade, I don't know. But I would think that as we have this demand in our society for, I got to have it now, the only way to do that is either move it in air freight, but as, as the air network has kind of skinned itself down, the ability to be able to ship in the belly of an airplane is greatly reduced. So then what's your next alternative? That's ocean. And if ocean can run an expedited service and take two, three, four, whatever the number of days off that transit time, that gets that demand factor for our, our society that they can get that product in a much uh, faster fashion. So I, I think it's going to continue in my opinion, and I don't think it's a flash in the pan. I think it's here to stay. I think you're absolutely right. And I think the, the, most of the indicators, you know, kind of point in that direction. Um, here's one, there's a, there's a couple of different questions around this, but I'll try to kind of weave it together. But have, from, from where you sit, do you see any changes in the sort of chassis provisioning model kind of longer term? So like whether that's more motor carriers getting into long-term leases or motor carriers purchasing some portion of their fleet, uh, their chassis fleet. Do you see any any sort of changes evolving in the in the the way uh, chassis are provisioned currently, and then kind of going forward? Yeah, Hal, that's kind of an interesting question. I I, I I'm not sure exactly how the landscape will play out going forward. I, I'll say this: when I was a dreaming, the thing that I always focused on was I wanted a chassis that was safe, reliable, and it was ready to go. I didn't want to use Sam's terminology, I didn't want to use be the free valet guy, and I didn't want to be free quality control. And I think that the chassis industry, uh, in my view, has done a fantastic job in trying to improve the quality of the equipment to make it safer, make it reliable, and minimize the number of times uh, an independent owner operator or company driver is forced to go to a flip line or go to roadability. I do think uh, that that's something that we have to continue to focus on. In regards to chassis provisioning, I, I think chassis provisioning is going to be interesting as to how much of it plays out on trucker-owned wheels, trucker lease wheels, or a pool chassis uh, model. Our view of things is we love to compete in that environment, and we love to be able to make our investment in our equipment, get our equipment to the highest possible standards, and effectively compete against a trucker owned set of wheels or a trucker leased piece of equipment. We believe that having control of our equipment is critical and allowing us to be able to differentiate our product uh, so that we can add value to our end user, which is the drage community, is critically important. And we believe that we offer an alternative to the industry that is more of a variable expense than a fixed expense. Uh, so at the end of the day, um, a lot of different dynamics, a lot of different views on how the model will ultimately play out. But I think there's always going to be a, a, a place for a trucker owned wheel, a trucker lease set of wheels, and the pool chassis. And to the credit of the IEPs, I think they've all done a great job of trying to bring the quality of the equipment up in the respective pools that they operate because we know that what we're competing against, we're not just competing against each other, we're competing against a drayman who makes a decision to buy a chassis or long-term lease a chassis. And quite candidly, when they do that, yeah, there might be some upside for us, but we would prefer that they, they continue to use a pool because we offer a variable cost asset uh, that's of high quality and is safe and reliable. Yeah, I remember hearing somebody tell me that intermodal is uh, you know one size fits one. Right. There's no one size fits all. It's uh, every individual business transaction can be unique. Um, and so, you know, the diversity of, of supply is, is really valuable, I think, for, for a lot of folks. Here's a good question about the industry. What do you think that the industry needs to do to attract more drivers? Do you think the driver shortage is real? And how does it impact the future of Intermodal? I think our industry has two huge challenges. One is driver and two is mechanical. 
we operate a small little company called Track Services where we have, I don't know, 160 some odd technicians, mechanics. Trying to find a mechanic these days is just as hard as trying to find a driver. And I think there are two huge challenges that we're going to have to figure out. You talked about the driver and what, what's it going to take. Look, as, as that regulation changes and reduces the age, the younger generation is, lack of better terms, coin operated. So how do we allow a driver to be able to earn as much money as possible all within the confines of the law? And again, it gets back to how do we as an industry get more loads per power unit per day? I hate to keep going back to that, but that's what it's all about because yeah. that makes the trucking company profitable. That makes the power unit profitable. That makes the driver profitable. And if we're going to be able to recruit people into this industry and have them stick in our industry, uh, look, it's not the most glamorous job in the world. They sometimes don't get treated the best they should. Then the only other alternative is that we've got to make sure that they're, they're making a decent buck. And to do that, we all have to get better. I agree with you wholeheartedly there. Well, unfortunately, we're about out of time. Val, thank you so much for spending time with us today, sharing your insights, taking the questions. We really appreciate it. So uh, many thanks to you. Many thanks to all of you who joined us today. We really appreciate it. If you've got any questions for us uh, or you'd like to learn more about our educational programming, this has been part of the Business of Intermodal Continues program. If you'd like to learn more about that, head over to intermodal.org and check things out. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot of new stuff that, that's happening there. Um, and if you have questions, go ahead and shoot us an email at info at intermodal.org, or you can just send me an email at how at intermodal.org. Again, we really appreciate you all being here. We really appreciate the help of our sponsors. Our silver and bronze um, year-long sponsors have helped make this program available to you today, um, and they go the extra mile for us, so we really appreciate it. Wear your mask, wash your hands, stay an appropriate distance apart from each other, and be safe out there.